Today, we're going to look at the second lesson in this unit. We're going to look at constructing linear and exponential functions of the real numbers that are comparable to arithmetic and geometric sequences. So today, rather than focusing on the sequences, we're going to focus on the functions behind them. So what's the difference? You might remember last class when we talked about arithmetic, we said arithmetic is similar to what type of a sequence? I mean, I'm sorry, what type of function? What is arithmetic similar to? Linear. linear. Arithmetic is similar to linear. The difference is arithmetic has a discrete domain. That's a big word there, discrete domain. What does that mean? Well, arithmetic might look like this. It might have a point at zero, and then at one, it might have another point, and then at two, it has another point, and it does resemble a line, but the domain is discrete, meaning it's not continuous. You see how these are just points along the way? That's not like a straight line. That's the difference. That right there is arithmetic. It's arithmetic because the domain is not all numbers. This domain here would be the values, their integers, greater than or equal to zeros. So if you're writing the domain, you would say uh, x is greater than or equal to zero, but it would not be all reals in there. It would be members that are whole numbers. So it'd be like that weird w. Now, I don't know how to do a very good double w, so I'm just going to do an extra line on the side. There are whole numbers, meaning numbers zero through whatever, but no fractions, no decimals, just the number zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's arithmetic. Well, what's linear? Linear would be a line. Now, do you see the difference of what I just did there? Are those domains the exact same? No, whoops. Yeah, that's right. Arith. No, it's not right. Doesn't have that either. There we go. Arithmetic. That's the arithmetic domain. The linear domain is different. It still is that x is greater than or equal to zero, but now what types of numbers are included? The real numbers. So all real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero all real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. So the difference is linear will include all the decimals and fractions in between the points. Arithmetic is only the points. That makes sense. Geometric is the same way. It's just geometric and exponential are going to be uh, not a straight line, but they're going to be curving up like an airplane taking off. Okay, so that's that's what we're looking at today. Are these would go be similar and exponential and geometric would be similar, okay? So that's the whole plan for today, is to show you how they relate and how they're different. All right, so let's specifically, let's talk about how these are related to one another. A linear function is comparable to the arithmetic sequence. Consider the following. In point slope form, what you learn about the equation of a line is this. We learned that we can write the equation of a line as y equals or f of x equals. Uh, there's a letter we use for slope. What's the slope? F. M. Now, what in the world? When you were in Algebra 1, most of y'all dealt with y equals mx plus b. But point slope looks like this. It was m times x minus x1 plus y1. Now, that was your formula for point slope. You probably don't remember that as well because you didn't work on it nearly as much. But that was uh, point slope, not slope intercept. Slope intercept was the y equals mx plus b. I can write that right here. It was slope intercept. That was y equals mx plus b. Y equals mx plus b. But this is point slope. Now, why do I give you point slope? Because you'll notice how similar it is to the arithmetic sequence. You remember last class, we said that an equals a k plus d times n minus k. Okay, I want you to compare the two. Now, what's similar to slope over here? When you compare the two, the d, the common difference is the slope. What is x1 equivalent to? The k, very good. And what's y1 equivalent to? Okay, so now on these points, you'll notice that k and x1 correspond to each other. 
and AK corresponds to Y1. Once again, it's just showing you it's the same formula. What's the difference? This domain, would it be discrete or continuous? Continuous. This has a continuous domain. Let's just add that. Why not? Let's add this as a continuous domain. Meaning if you were drawing it out, you would never pick up your pencil. You would draw it as one straight line. Over here, arithmetic does not have a continuous domain. It has a discrete domain. That just means like the whole numbers. You'd have a point at zero, point at one, point at two, point at three, and so on. That's the difference, okay? Now let's do the same thing, a little cheat sheet for us for geometric. So exponential functions. Now here's what's weird. I'm gonna have to add, uh, it's just, it's not gonna blend in as well. The true function for exponential, what I want you to put here first, the true function that you'd see all the time is this. Like if you Google it, it'll say A times B to the power of X, like that. Now that's if you've Googled it, how it'll look. Now in a second, I'm gonna make a slight error to a slight change to make it correspond here. But last class we learned about geometric and we said that is GN, it's GN equals what? GK times R to the power of N minus K. Now, what I'm gonna do here to make it correspond better is I'm gonna add in a transformation. And because I can see what they did here, I'm just gonna add this minus X1. And now the equations would correspond totally to one another. The base, here B stands for base, B is for base. The base corresponds to what in geometric? The common ratio. The A corresponds to GK. Notice A and GK correspond to one another. And that means that K corresponds to X1. Now, typically, like I said, if you go to Google, it'll just say A times B to the power of X. Next class, we're going to spend the entire class talking about how we can transform, uh, like whenever you're adding or subtracting to the power, what you can do to play around with that. So next class, we're going to take that away because truthfully, you can take away any horizontal translations, but that's next class. So we'll get there. That's why if you Google it, you won't see that minus X1, and that's why it'll disappear. Uh, but that's next class. So until then, I'm going to leave that formula like that. Or actually, you might just want to say uh, future for the future. We're just going to say it's y equals a dot b to the power of x. For the future, that's what it'll be. Okay. But for today, we're going to leave it just like this. All right. Again, uh, an exponential function has a continuous domain. This has a continuous domain. Whereas, what does continuous domain mean again? It's like uh, one curve, you never pick up your pencil if you're graphing it. Over here, we'd have a discrete domain. What does discrete mean? It's like the whole numbers, discrete domain. It'd be at the plate, the values like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth. Okay, there's a little cheat sheet for you. I'm giving you, it's just because we haven't dealt with exponentials. On the next slide, I did just kind of show you a picture so you can look back. What is uh, exponential supposed to look like? I'm going to add a few things to this that are important for exponential to know. On an exponential function, you have a y, uh, excuse me, I almost said y-intercept. You have a horizontal asymptote. Uh, that's not the color I was looking for. I was looking for red. Let me try it one more time. You have a horizontal asymptote, there you go, at y equals zero. So go ahead with your ID badge, if you could, just add a dashed line. 
at y equals zero. Exponential functions have a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. You'll hear me call this uh, that they'll have three key features. That's one of them. Exponential functions have a asymptote at y equals zero. That's a horizontal asymptote. Now this shows you a picture of exponential growth. Why do you think it's growth? It's always increasing, always increasing. I can't write diagonal very far or very well, but that's why it's always increasing. That's why we would call that uh, exponential growth. What's happening on this decay? It's always decreasing. So this one's always decreasing. I'm gonna try using my smart board to see if that can help me out. Always decreasing and let's just let it do the turning of my writing. Let's see, this might be a better way of doing it. This is always decreasing along there. It's always decreasing going down. Now, some other points. Uh, this came out of our the pre-cal textbook I used for like regular pre-cal. Uh, they don't deal with the letter A. You will be tested on the letter A, which means this point's going to be different. I want you to change this to a zero comma A. That is a second key feature. It, that point right there will be zero comma A. Whatever your A is, that's where it's going to hit the Y axis. That's a second key feature. So first is a horizontal asymptote that it's going to approach. Secondly, is it'll go through the Y axis at the value zero comma a, whatever your a value is. Third, third key value is it'll go through the point one comma a times b. So it'll always go through the point one comma a times b. Those are the three key features that you really need to know for exponential functions, whether it's growth or decay, it's the same way. It'll go through those, uh, it'll have a uh, horizontal asymptote, it'll go to the point, uh, point zero comma a, and it'll go to the point one comma a dot b. It's growth if it's always increasing, it's decay it's a, if it's always decreasing. Got those notes added? So those are just some key features. If you're like, what's an exponential? I don't even know, never dealt with them. There it is. There's some key features for you. All right. Let's start with some of these problems. We're going to start with the domain. When you look at this picture here, what can you tell me about the two equations when you compare them? They're both increasing. That's looking at the picture. What can you tell me about the equations? They're similar. They're very similar. We have a value that's multiplying, a value of two that's multiplying this base of 1.3, which is being raised to the power of n or x. So what's the difference when you look at the graph? Do the graphs look exactly the same? No. Now, this has what type of domain? Exponential. Yeah, it, well, it's an exponential function. So its domain is, it's continuous. It's all real. So here's what I want you to write. For the domain here, since they use the letter x, this would have the domain that x is all reals. You know, and I just realized they went farther to the left. So uh, earlier, we could have made our domain all reals. This is not just greater than or equal to zero. This is all reals. It's going left forever, and it's going to the right forever. Nothing's stopping. So the domain is all reals, all real numbers. However, over here, does this graph go left forever? No. Now, it will continue to go right forever. Difference, though, are all the points connected? No. no. So since they're using the letter N, let's fix this. You got to work with what you got to work with. This is a picture. They shouldn't have used the letter X here. What is the independent variable in this problem? N. N. I'm going to change that to an N. And so I'm going to say, what is true about N? N are the numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. However, it's not all real numbers that are greater than or equal to zero. It's only the, what type of numbers? Whole numbers, N-E-W, N-E-W. And it's a, technically a double W, so I'm just going to add that extra line here. That just means it can't be 1.5 or 2.5, but it could be 
zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So one more time, an exponential function is very similar to geometric. The difference is really the domain. That's the big difference, the domain. And arithmetic is very similar to linear. Once again, the difference being the domain. All right, with all that, let's start looking at some problems. It says a function has the following coordinate points. Could the function represent a linear function, exponential function, or neither? So there's multiple different ways of doing this. What I would suggest is checking to see if it's linear first. If it's linear, that's going to be similar to arithmetic. So what you would want to see, if you remember for arithmetic, that's not how you spell arithmetic. If it was arithmetic, we use the letter D, and we said D equals any term minus the term that came before it. Now, that's how I did it last class for arithmetic. What we've done in the past for linear is we've done change of y's divided by change of x. How much am I changing here my y's? How much do my y's change? Three. And you would divide it by the change of x. What's my change of x? One. Three divided by one is three. And then you would check to see, is it the same here? How much did my y's change? Twelve. How much did my x's change? Now, is that the same? So the common difference, this is not a common difference. This is not a common difference because you'd say these two are not equal to each other. So it's not a common difference. Or if you don't want to use a common difference, common difference is similar to slope. You'd say it has no consistent slope because they're changing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what do we just discovered? It is not linear or arithmetic. So how do you check to see if it's exponential? What you do is you do division. You take four and you divide it by one. And then you do a power of whatever the change of X is. The change of X goes here. Let me give you a little formula. It's the change of X root of the change of Y, uh, dividing change of Y's. Uh, let me do it this way. Y2 over Y1. That's the formula you're using. So on this one, how much, what are my Y's? It's four and one. And you do it to the root of, what's three minus two? One, that goes there. So it's the first root, which the first root does nothing. I don't know that. First root, that means dividing by the power of one does nothing. So what is four divided by one? Four. Okay, let's check and see if the next works the same. If I did this one, it would be one more time. We'll have a root 16 over four. And what's my change of X's? One. Uh, let me just write it out so you can see it. It's four minus three there. Now, if you're doing the first root, the first root does nothing. First root will not change the problem at all. So what is 16 divided by four? Four. Now, is that the same? Then that means that it's our, uh, that is our base, our B. I put B there. That's what our base is, or our common ratio. Since they're equal to one another, it is exponential. This is an exponential function. Now, that's all it says is to find what type it is. Uh, if you wanted to write an equation, what I would recommend you do is actually use the geometric formula. That way you're not memorizing a ton of formulas. I'll go ahead just for the practice of it. We'll find this equation. It's good practice from last class. Do you remember the formula for geometric? It was G. N equals G K times R exponent of N minus K. That's right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just plug in a point to solve for what we're not what we're missing. I'm going to call. Uh, do I want to use two one? Are you okay if I use two one? You can pick any of the points. Are you okay with two one? Yes. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call this. Uh, let me switch colors here. I'm going to call this K and this GK. 
Follow? So I'm going to say that GN would equal, what's GK? One. One times my rate. What is our rate? Four. Raised to the power of, uh, you know, you don't have to do the parentheses there. Let me keep it the same. I'm sorry. One times four to the power of N minus, what was my K? Two. Two. Now there it is in geometric. So if I wanted to change this to exponential, all I would do is I would say this is no longer gn. I would replace it with f of x equals. When you multiply by 1, do I need to keep the 1? So I'm just going to say it's 4 to the power of n minus 2. I don't need the parentheses. There's my equation right there. And if you wanted to confirm this, do I want to confirm or not confirm? Would you like the writing break to see it in the calculator or are you okay with what, where it is? What do you want to do? Break. All right, go open up your calculator. Let's go to graph. I want you to type that in and then press control T. So I'm gonna go home screen, new document. I'm gonna choose not to save. I want you to open up a graph. Uh, not a widget. Uh, graph. And type in the equation. We had four raised to the power of. Oh, did I switch it to an? I didn't switch it from an n. We don't use the letter n here. Sorry. Just realized when I was about to type it in. Uh, we're using for exponential. You don't use the letter n. What letter do we use instead? X. X. Sorry. 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 Four to the power of x minus two. Four to the power of x minus two. Make sure the minus two is in the power. Press enter. Does it look like it's exponential? Yeah, look, it has that horizontal asymptote. Okay, now, if you're wondering why did it not go through that point, you said it was gonna go through zero comma A, my A is one, why is it not going there? It's because it's been shifted right two units. So that's where it's gonna be there this time. Anyways, you're probably not thinking that. Press control T. You're probably thinking, tell me about the table. We, I gave you the points two comma one. I gave you the point three comma four. And what other point did I give you? Four comma six. Are they all there? Yes. You bet. There they are right there. Those are our points. And so now let me go ahead and add these over to our notes. So we have them. Yeah, there it is. Whoops. So we can see we got the right answer. Okay, let's reload and do this again. All right, this time we're gonna go a little faster. Does it? Does this appear to be appear to you to be arithmetic? What do you think? Does it seem like we are adding the same amount over consecutive? X's. What am I adding by here? I add four. What do I add by here? Three. Three. Are those the same? No. So it's not a slope or common difference. It's not a slope or a common difference because these two are not equal. So now if you want to check, is it a exponential function with the same, what's my base versus, is it a common ratio? What you do is, if they're consecutive, you don't have to do that third root, what I was talking about. You just divide one by the other. Let's check. So you take seven, and you divide it by three. I don't have to do anything because it's a six and a five. So I don't have to do that root portion thing because six minus five, what is six minus five? One. one. And the first root of anything is itself. It's like raising it to the power of one. There's no difference. It's actually dividing by the power of one. But it does nothing to you. So I don't need that. Is seven thirds the same thing as, now let's try 10 divided by seven. Are those the same? Are those the same fraction or are they different? They're different. So if they're not equal, then what do we say about this? It's not arithmetic. Not uh, That's not the word for today. Today the word is linear. It's not linear. 
Here it's not exponential. So the answer for today is it's neither linear nor exponential. Neither, whoops, neither linear. nor exponential. Question over that one. So since it's neither of those two, we won't find the equation for it. Let's look at C. What's happening on C? What you want to check for first, arithmetic or uh, geometric, meaning linear or exponential. exponential. You want to try exponential first? OK, you do a division. 7 divided by negative 1. But what's my change in x's? So this is a square root this time. What is 7 divided by negative 1? Negative 7. Can you take a square root of negative 7? That's imaginary. It's not real. Uh, that would be that would be i square root of 7. You can't do that, so it's not it's not exponential, nor is it geometric. That's imaginary. You can't do it. When you look at those two, you can't do it. That's because you can't take a square root of negative number. If you're not sure, type that in, and it'll say error in the calculator. Can't do it. So it's not that. OK, so now what's the other one we want to try? Let's try arithmetic. So if I try arithmetic, I'm saying how much am I adding or subtracting here? Find my slope or my common difference. How much does that add by? 8. So I add by 8. And it's change y over change of x. Remember, it's change of y over change of x. So what I'm doing is I'm adding 8. And what's my x is changing by? From 3 to 5? 2. 2. So it's 8 over 2. And then over here, and I go from this one to this one, what's my change in y's? 15 minus 7 is 8. And what's the change in x's? 2. Is that equal to one another? So this is a slope or a common difference. What is that slope? What is 8 divided by 2? 4. Four. So we said it's not exponential here. Not exponential. Not exponential. Since it was imaginary, but it is, uh, it is linear. Since it's a linear function, we can find the equation. Again, just as, as practice, so you don't have to memorize so many formulas, I'm going to write down the arithmetic formula, and we'll solve from there. The arithmetic was a n equals what? a k plus d times n minus k. Which problem? We can use any one of them. Which, which value you want to use? Again. Which one are we going to use? Five, seven. Okay, I'm going to call this K and AK this time. That's K and AK. We're just going to use five and seven. Doesn't matter which one you pick, you should always get the same answer. So the formula would be AN equals what's our AK? Seven plus what do we say our common difference is? Four times n minus k is 5. When I simplify this, we'll have our actual equation. This will be 7 plus, I'm going to distribute here, 4n. And then what's 4 times negative 5? Minus 20. Do I have any common terms? 7 and minus 20. So I'm going to call this 4 n what's 7 minus 20 13. minus 13 if you change it to a linear function you would say the equation is not a n anymore i want to say f of x equals or and not a n what letter do we use instead 
x. 4x minus 13, and that would be your answer right there. You could check in the calculator, but we're just going to trust this right this time. All right. So there it is. You've seen how we do these. We've seen how to convert. Let's start now applying this a little bit different. It says, if we know a function is linear or exponential, meaning arithmetic or geometric sequence, then only two distinct values are necessary to create an equation or rule for the function or sequence. So this is basically what we did last class, just almost verbatim here. It says, it is known that f of x is linear. If it's linear, what is that going to be similar to? Arithmetic. arithmetic. Go ahead and write arithmetic here. Not as a cross out. I mean to write arithmetic as in that they're similar. That passes through these points. Write an equation for this function. I'm going to use the arithmetic formula so you don't forget that formula. I need you to memorize it. That, so that's what I'm going to use here today just to help train it out. What was the arithmetic equation? Very good. That There it is. So the formulas are very similar to one another. They have either AN or GN, AK, GK. Arithmetic has a plus. Geometric has a multiplier. Then D or R, if it's a common difference, common ratio. And then N and K might come together next. So that's the same order. It's just whether or not you're adding or multiplying, whether or not you're multiplying or raising to a power. That's the only difference in the formulas from last class. Okay, we're gonna plug in. We have two values. Do you remember last class, did I tell you, is AN the earlier term or the later term? Later, so AK is the earlier. Go over here and label this. This is K comma AK. This is going to be N comma AN. So we'll plug those in and solve. What is an on this problem? What do I substitute for an? One. One. What do I substitute for ak? Seven. Seven. Plus, what do I substitute for d? D. We don't know. That's what we're going to leave as a d. What about n? What about k? Three. And now we're going to do some good old-fashioned algebra. 8 minus 3, uh, I'm following PEMDAS here. PEMDAS says look for parentheses first. I'm going to simplify the parentheses. 8 minus 3 is 5. five. So that will be D times 5. Now what could I do? We want to isolate this D to solve for it. We could divide by five. I would actually do one thing first. Let's subtract the seven. So when I subtract that seven, what's one minus seven? Six. Negative six equals, and I'm going to write, rewrite this. D times five is 5D. And last step here. Divide by five. So our common difference is negative six over five. Now it says write an equation for this. That right here, if I plug that in, that would be arithmetic. So what I'm gonna do now is change it to linear. Linear says f of x equals, you write the slope first. What did we just find out that the slope is? Negative six over five. And then you do x minus x one. Now we haven't chosen. So which one do you want to be x one? Three, uh, do you want to use the first coordinate point or the second coordinate point? First. You want to use the first? So we'll say x minus three. And then you do a plus, what's the y value? Seven, negative seven. That's right. Oh, if you're wondering why did I do a minus three? Because inside always lies. You see how that goes inside with an x? It's going to lie. The positive three became a? Negative. negative three, but the y value does not lie. It's this positive seven. There's your equation right there. That's it. That's a linear function. 
if you wanted it in arithmetic form, the only thing different is we would have ended up with AK being three. No, I'm sorry. AK was seven plus the common difference. It actually would have changed it to a minus. Minus six fifths times N minus K is three. That's how it would look if it was arithmetic. There's linear. That's arithmetic. So really, it's just the order, but it's the same equation. All right, let's try it again on part B. So this example two should be straight up from last class. Same thing, it's just we're reviewing how to use the values. It is known that f of x is exponential. What does it mean if it's exponential? Or what is it similar to? Let me change my words. What is it similar to if it's exponential? Geometric. Geometric. So go up here, put that this... is geometric. And the reason I do that is I don't want you to have to memorize a million formulas. I just want you to memorize two. So what is the geometric formula? Perfect. Okay, so let's label. Did we say last class, is GN the earlier coordinate point or the later coordinate point? Later. This one's later. This one is earlier. So we're going to go label. This is going to be K, G, K. This over here is going to be N, G, N. So let's plug in some values. In this case, what is GN? What is GK? What is our ratio? We don't know. What is N? And what is K? So now we go to solve. Uh, I want to get R isolated. What's the opposite of multiplying by 5? We'll divide by 5. And when I rewrite this, I will simplify r to the power of, what's 4 minus 2? Two. 2. Now, to solve this, you have to get rid of a square. What's the opposite of a square? Square root. Mathematically, whenever you're canceling a square that's not originally there, you need to have a plus or minus with it. Because we don't know if it's the positive or if it's the negative. Now that's not a very good value, is it? And you know what? I'm just out, I'm thinking on the fly here. Now this mathematically is true what I wrote down here, but for exponential to be continuous, an exponential function, you're gonna learn this uh, next class. For exponential function, not for geometric. Geometric can have a positive or a negative ratio. For exponential functions to be continuous, it has to have a positive ratio. So R equals uh, negative, so not the positive negative uh, since not R. I'm going to say B. Sorry, I'm switching to B. It is true that R would be plus or minus this square root. Your base equals that since the base has got to be greater than zero. You're going to uh, that's going to come up tomorrow. Your base, I say tomorrow, next class, when we do packet two, three, you're gonna learn the base has to be positive. So I'm not gonna do plus or minus here. What you doing? So when I write down my exponential function, I'm gonna use this as my base. So now let's go write an equation. The equation for uh, exponential, you would say f of x equals, that A term is similar to GK. The A term is your GK. What was our GK? Five times, I'm gonna put this in a parenthesis. 
the 12, uh, excuse me, square root of 12 fifths raised to the power of Two. the X minus the K. What's our K value? Two. Two. Now, next class, we're actually going to learn a better way to simplify this. Question for you. What would you prefer? I'm going to stop here and put the answer. Do you want me to kind of go into the future and show you how we can simplify that? Or do you want to just leave that for next class? Simplify. Are you all in a spot where you're ready? What we're going to learn next class is a root is the same thing as dividing by a power. I mentioned it today. What that means, so in the future is what I'm going to do here. In the, uh, and I'll just say in lesson two, two dash three. In lesson two dash three. What we're going to learn is this, that this will be equal to five times, and I'm going to say this 12 fifths, I'm going to take away the root, but I'm going to raise it to the one half. You're going to learn a square root is the same thing as dividing by the power of two. The 12 fifths itself was a power of one. A square root is like a dividing power of two. Well, all of this is being raised, so sneak in another parenthesis, to the power of x minus 2. And what you learn next class is you can distribute that right there. A power raised to a power multiplies. And so what we'll get next class is that this equation could be written as f of x equals 5 times, I'm only going to write one parenthesis this time, 12 fifths with no root. What's 1 half times x? just a half of a X minus what's one half times negative two, negative one. You could actually rewrite this answer this way. Now that's next lesson. So it'll give you something to look forward to over the weekend right there. Cause I'm sure you can't wait. Y'all aren't on my dad jokes, huh? Okay. <laughs> not interested but that'll be uh coming up how we can simplify those but for now you can just leave it leave the answer like that all right do you have any questions for me no so this is the part of the lesson i really 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 like what we're going to do here is we're going to transition and I'm going to pause for a second before I go further in exponentials. That's why I decided I'm going to get into the nitty gritty math next class. What I decided to do here is I'm going to just pause and say, why are we learning this stuff? Did you know this is some of the most influential stuff you could use for math acts for your life? This exponentials that I've been walking you over. You probably don't believe me. Truthfully, uh, show of hands in this room. So we got 31 of you here because all 31 are present. How many of you would like to buy a house someday? Do any of you have, uh, we Googled this in my other class, the median household. Y'all go ahead and Google again. I'm trying to remember because it's been, uh, A-Day was a little bit ahead of y'all. Go Google, what's the Texas median? That means what occurs most often, house price. Texas median house price. Texas median house price. Okay, y'all, uh, everyone in the room, I said, who wants to buy a house someday? And everyone's hand went up. Do you have $351,000 to your name? No. So how are you going to buy a house? You're going to have to have a mortgage. Mortgages are based on exponential loans. Different question. How many of you would like to become a millionaire? No hands go up. Really? Be honest. How many of you would like to be? Some of you are like, no, I want to be a billionaire. Okay. <laughs> How are you going to get there? Some of you might be like, well, I'm just waiting to be filmed doing something stupid enough that it trends on YouTube or on Instagram <laughs> or on TikTok. And I mean, but how do most people make a million dollars? And if you say it's because of my parents, it's not true. Uh, what percentages? Oh, here we go. What percentage? I'm, I'm showing, I'm Googling this stuff. So you don't think I'm a liar. I'm giving you the facts here. What percentage of millionaires are uh, self-made? You know what that means? 
Whoops, I put or. 90, 79. Do you know what that means? Self-made? You made your own money. You didn't get it from your parents. How many? 79%, 79 which is basically four out of five. So any and one out of five, sure. They get it from their parents, their grandparents, whatever else. Most people, that's not how they become millionaires. What I'm walk you through is how you can, you, literally you, you can be part of that 80% of millionaires that were self-made how that can happen it usually happens through business there are some who do it because of athletics there are some who do it because they're exceptional musicians um there are some who do it because for whatever reason people follow on social media whatever the wild reason is they do it and they become that way but most people do it through business i'm about to show you how you can do that now how many of you want to be broke no hands okay how many of you want to be in debt Truthfully, here's the next one. Uh, Google, what is the, uh, what's it called? What's it called? Uh, U.S. consumer debt. What is the U.S. consumer debt? That means what do we, not national government. Uh, I'll show you. This is a different number. What do you see here? Total consumer debt. 17.7. Oh, okay. That's a ton of money. I want to walk you through what how much money that is. Do you know how many people are in the, this? When I say consumer debt, that does not mean the debt of the U.S. government. If you Google that, it's like in the forty trillions. Okay, uh, you can if you don't believe me, what is the U.S. national debt? And that'll tell you what with the government, what they owe, and all that. Uh, this says thirty three trillion. That's old news. There's no way it's only thirty three trillion. Well, maybe it is thirty three trillion. I I'm looking like for forty eight point nine. There it is. This one. So what it's doing is it's adding consumer debt plus. That's the government. Sorry. That's what I was looking for. As a country, we own we owe almost 50 trillion. That's not what I want here. What I want to talk about is how much do you and I, if we added up all the U's and all the me's across the country, how much do we all owe together? It's 7.06 trillion. Now let's go to the calculator and do some something wild real fast. Go to your calculator. And I'm just doing this as a setup to show you what I'm about to teach you is very important. As I made the statement, this is the most important thing you can learn from me. Unless you want to be an engineer, then sure, you got to know some algebra from me and stuff like that. But for a lot of you, you're here just to raise up your GPA. I want that college credit. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. I want to show you why this, what I'm about to teach is the most important thing for you. If that's you, you're here to raise your GPA. You're here for your college credit. Well, now you're here for an extra purpose. So hopefully you're not broke. Hopefully you might be one of the wealthy ones. Some of you, I get it. Your politics, you're like, no, I don't want to be wealthy. Those people are me. Deep down, you know you're lying to yourself. <laughs> Every one of you in here knows you prefer to have some money. So 17.06 trillion. What does that mean? 1706. Now, if it's trillion, is that a trillion right there? No. That's a thousand. 17,000. What if I added three more zeros? Now, where am I at? That's 17 million. What if I added three more zeros? That's a billion. Okay, well, three more zeros. Now that now you're looking at 17.06 trillion. That's what that number looks like. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this. Uh, I added three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It took ten zeros to get to 17.0 trillion. Now, I'm going to go back to Google one more time. How many people... are in the United States, are in the USA. 339, okay, let's just say 332, I'll do the exact exact number, 331.9 million. Okay, 331.9. So if I'm doing million, it's 331 million. There, I added two zeros. Is that 331 million right there? That's 331 thousand so i need to add three zeros now is that 331 million there's a group of three there's that it is now press enter it's about to blow your mind some of you are going to be like this is not true at all what i'm about to say and it's 100 percent true i just showed you the stats press enter you know what we just found whoops how about this press control enter do, we, do you know what we just saw for the average debt per person so Right now, Guadalupe, you owe $51,000, like credit cards, houses, stuff like that. Do you, Emily? 
you and Jacoby, y'all probably like go around the room, you're like, that's not true. I don't know nothing. I don't know Jack. But this is average, which means if y'all don't all ja own Jack, I probably own hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is actually kind of true. When you, when you factor in the house. The problem is house isn't try isn't quite right because of the thing that's different with a house, it's a better debt than just about anything else in this world that I know of. The reason a house is a better debt is I bought my house two years ago and I had to take out a three hundred and thirty-two thousand dollar loan. I just saw that my statement came in the mail uh yesterday, I think. So it's three hundred and thirty-two thousand is what I originally owed the bank. Why is not as bad of a debt if I sold my house today? Does it sell for that amount? No, no. no it increases the value. So I could pay off that debt and still have some extra. I don't know of anything else in this world that works that way, other than maybe a business. So like you buy a car. Let's say the, the loan is $30,000. If you try to sell it a year later, are you going to get $30,000 for your car? No. It's going to lose value. And so sometimes you pay that off and you still owe them money and you don't even have a car anymore. That's what I mean by a house is a little bit different. But if you go around all the people in the United States and you add them all up and add out all the debts and you divide it, average person's $51,000 in debt. I have a four-month-old daughter. She's including this. My four-month-old on average would have $51,000. That's how high of a number this is. You think about it. Do you have debt? No. Do all your little siblings and whatever in you know, fifth grade, sixth grade have debt? No. That's how much an adult must have. Not this number, but a bigger number because it's got to average out. So what am I trying to set the table for you? These formulas can either set you in a spot to put you on a track to where you can become really wealthy and become like a millionaire. Or if you ignore what I'm about to teach you today and you do the opposite, it'll set you on track to be in all kinds of debt. That's the facts. So do I have your attention now? <laughs> Let me show you some stuff because we're going to run through some numbers here. There are two formulas you're going to need for these exponentials. Here they are. It's the compound interest and the continuous compound. Most businesses operate off of this formula. If you take financial classes in college, they'll call this a pert because what does it look like? Pert. pert. There's a pert and there's also this one. Now this one's different. This is when the interest is compounded a certain times per year. Many things in real life are this way, like credit cards. Credit cards charge a person interest once per month not all the time it's once per month my mortgage i have to pay the bank they calculate the interest once per month do businesses only make money once per month no. how often do they make money that's this formula continuously is like a business you use this formula things like a car payment a house payment credit cards you'd use this formula these are the two formulas you need okay n would be the number of times per year just make sure you highlight that that's the part that everybody forgets what they say, what is N? N is the number of times it's compounded per year. So most things in real life in the, Amer in the United States of America, how often do you have to pay for a car loan? Every month. Once a month. How often do you have to pay for a house? Every month. Once a month. You would say, how many times, how many months are there in a year? 12. 12. In those cases, N would be 12. That's the most common in real world. That's most common, okay? So let's get started. By the way, A is the final amount. P is the initial investment. P is the principal. There's the word right there. P is the initial. And A is the account value after T years. Okay, so let's get going. Uh, the numbers I give you today are 100% legit. I do not just make up random numbers. 100% legit. If I say that when I use, I'm going to use a bunch of companies here, they're 100% legit. No lies in this lesson. Okay, I looked them up. You can check them all if you want to when you walk out. Mr. and Mrs. Jimenez, all I made up was the story behind the problems. Everything else is factual. Found an educational savings account for their daughter that pays 5% interest compounded monthly. Since I added this, this interest has actually gone up a little bit. If you pay attention to any financial things, which you probably don't, but which is kind of good for you. You're 17. You show it too much, but it's, it's wise to know how they work. If they invest $5,000 for their daughter and make no deposits or withdrawals, what would be the value of account after 18 years? Here's my thinking. I just had a four-month-old daughter. If I wanted to start saving for a college, when's the best time to start saving for a college? Now. When she's 17? No. Right now. Let's say I had $5,000 and I put it in the account. Mm -hmm. They made 5%. Let's see what it'd be. Okay. 
This tells you somewhere what type of a, uh, interest it is. Compounded how? Where does it say? Right here. Compounded monthly. Does that mean it's compounded all the time? Continuously? No. no. It's a certain number of times per year. It's, it's a discrete. It's the other formula. So you're going to use compound monthly. This is the formula. A equals P times 1 plus R over N to the power of nt that's compounded monthly if it's compounded monthly though n is how many times per year and if you want to make a note so you if you that's because 12 months in a year that's why n is 12. okay now on today's lesson, I haven't told you how to solve all these yet. So what we're going to do for the sake of time is today we're just going to end solve. But by the time we finish unit two, which is going to be closing in on Christmas, you're going to know how to do all this by hand. Uh, it says 5%. What do you think 5% is in this problem? That's our R. Now, you can't type it in as 5%. And so what you can do is you divide it by 100%. Uh, because 100% is the same thing as 1. Percent symbols cancel. And so 5 divided by 100 is the same thing as point, how about 0 0.5. Now, if y'all didn't know that, all you do is you move the decimal over two times. You add a decimal, move it left two times. So our rate is 0 0.05. Okay, what's that 5,000 right there? That's the principal. That's the starting amount. When I use the calculator, I'm not going to do a dollar sign, nor am I going to do a comma. No commas, no dollar signs. And then finally, what's this 18? Use time. That's time. Now, I made this one easy. We don't have to insolve at all. It's already, the, the variable is isolated. So by itself, we can just type this in. We don't have to use insults. So let's go to our calculator. See how much money is my 5,000 worth? So if I have 5,000 saved up today and I say, I'm going to set this aside for my daughter. This is for her college fund. And if I sit aside today and I don't touch it, I just pretend like that money wasn't there. Well, let's see what it turns into. One plus a rate of 0 0.05 over 12. Raised to the power of 12 times 18. 12 times 18. If you're on Desmos, by the way, you'll need to put a parenthesis around the power. Uh, it won't, if you don't put a parenthesis, every time you hit times 18, it's going to go off to the side. It won't stay up in the power, just so you know. All right, hit enter. What value did you come up with? 12,275. Now, that's not bad. Now, some of you are like, well, that won't pay for college. But I want you to think about this. How much money did I actually work for myself? I work for $5,000. How much do I have for my daughter when she goes to college? 12275 12, $12,275.04. Now, the idea is that I already have this money saved up. And so that 5000 I already have saved is now worth 12000 Now, she's my fifth daughter, so I'm really having to say for all the kids but the idea is that's what that original five thousand worth anything extra i say i could invest in and it could also grow what's better five thousand twelve thousand two hundred seventy five twelve thousand okay let me say it this way how much did you work for uh, how much of that did you not work for about seven thousand two hundred so did you actually get more money from what you worked for or what was not worked for not you got paid because you were patient. How does this work? How can it just grow out of nothing? What happens is if you have the money on this front end, what they'll do is you'll put it in an account and those people are gonna lend it out to the, I'm gonna do quotes here, because life is, this isn't true for all people. Sometimes you have to take out debt because of life situations. But most people in America don't borrow money because they're in certain circumstances. They borrow money because they want to buy something. They get on Amazon. And they see something, they just, oh, I like that. And they click that little button that says, 
Starts with a B, ends and rhymes with buy. There you go. Press buy. And it goes in the cart. And then they have, oh, you can buy this with a credit card. Click. And what they're doing is they're taking smart person's 5,000. So I'm taking Scion's 5,000. I'm saying, hey, you want a credit card? Okay. And I take his money and I give him over here. And I'm going to make a ton of money off whoever borrows. And I'm going to pay Scion 5% of it. It's safe. I guarantee him he's going to get 5%. So he makes money. While you are paying him, and I'm the middleman just making, I'm Amazon, just making bank in the process. That's why uh, it goes back and forth between Jeff Bezos, the uh, owner of Amazon, and Elon Musk as being the richest people in the world. That's how they're making all their money. It's not because they're selling all that stuff. It's all the jokers who are clicking credit cards, paying that, not paying it back, all that. That's how it works. Let's do another one. This is 5%. Mr. Randell purchased Google stock in 2010. The cost of Google stock, I put the symbol right there in case you want to look this up. You're like, I don't know about these things. You can look this up. It's right there in your packet. Was $14.90 on January 1st, 2010. That was when I started investing. Okay. Was just turn of the year. I was doing my taxes and I realized, oh, I get a big discount if I start investing. And so that's when I started. It was 2010. That's why I looked at that date. I don't know if it was January 1st, but. That's what the price was, $14.90. On October 1st, 2023, the price of Google was $138.04. Using the continuous compound interest formula. Which formula is that? Perch. A per. Find the rate of interest for Google over the approximately 14 years of growth. Let's plug in our stuff. $14.90. What will that be on this problem? Um, That's our P. So go to your P, and I want you to put here, this is going to be $14.90. What is the $138.04? That's our A. $138.04. Oh, we don't know rate. E, by the way, is a number. It's like 2.72. It's like pi. It's a constant. It does not change. You don't solve for E. Uh, but we do know T. What's our T in this problem? 14. That's going to go in there. So the only thing we don't know is R. That's what we're solving for. So we're going to end solve this one today because I haven't taught you how to solve those yet. So go to your calculator. Press menu 3-1. It was $138.04. Is that right? Y'all have the packets in front of you? Equaled $14.90. E, we don't know our rate, but we know it's 14 years. Hey, for your calculators, a lot of people have errors here. I'm going to flip it. Don't put R14. It won't work. Put 14R. If you put R14, it won't work. And then if you don't know how to insolve, after you type in the whole equation, you have to do comma R. Press enter and see what you get. Did you get basically 0. 0.159? Yes. So what does that mean? If our R, if our R is 0. 0.159, let me do a squiggly, that means I'm rounding then that means the rate of growth is what in percentage? 15.9%. Now that's true facts. That's not a made up number. That's how much Google has grown at. So now let's move on to part two here. If the stock continues at this growth rate and Mr. Rangel's initial investment was $3,000 in 2010, what will his stock be worth at... 2030. So notice, I told you I bought it in 2010. I don't think I actually had three. I think I had about a total of $3,000 in 2010. And I split it up between this and Apple. But let's see what that value is worth. Let's just pretend all my money I put in or Mr. Rangel's money went into this. We don't know A anymore, but we do know P. What's our new P? E, we know our rate. What's our rate? 15.9. 0.159, whoops, 0.159. And now how many years are we doing this? For 20, from 2010 
the 2030. Let's go and see. Take a guess first before you type it in. Just go on a number. 30,000. What do you think? 30, 30? Is that what you said? 30. Okay, three to 30. Any other takers? Let's go find out. Go to your calculator. 3,000. E to the power point 159 times 20. Press enter. What do you get? What would that 3,000 turn into if you never touched it and you left it in Google? 72. $72,140.26. Hey, I'm going to give you something else that's awesome. You're not taxed on any of that until you sell it. Oh, that's true. Until you sell it, you don't pay any taxes on that money. So when you go work at a job and you're making some and you're looking down there, what taxes is taking out? That's not how it works with companies. You do not pay on these stocks until you sell the company. Then you sell that stock. You never pay any taxes. So uh, I'm going to say this is approximately, as we're rounding, $72,000, 140 and how much change? 26. So remember a second ago, I told you that was the educational savings account. It was a safe 5%. They're telling you, we will pay you five. It's safe. It's not going to be four. It's not going to be six. It's locked in at five. Can't do better. Can't do worse. You buy a business, it can go belly up or it could make more. In Google's case, it's made more. What did $3,000 turn into? So remember previously it was 5,000 turned into 12,000 and some change. Here, 3,000 turned into 72,000. All we did was added two extra years. What would you rather have? Five turning into 12 or three turning into 72? 72. Now, I didn't, I, I'll tell you, when I got out of college, I learned about this stuff. I didn't buy it right away. I graduated in 2008. I started investing in 2010. Quick story here. Um, so I started investing then. I meet my wife in 2013. I get engaged to her in 2014. So I got to go buy a ring. Now, I had set up my accounts just to buy the same stocks over and over. So whenever I'm doing cash, you buy. I go to buy a ring. Now, my ring is cheap. Guys' rings are cheap. It's ridiculous. Mine costs $25. And I actually paid for my own ring. My wife didn't pay for it. <laughs> but I go to pay hers. I don't remember what it was, but it was literally thousands of dollars. You can buy a $100,000 ring if you want. To. It's crazy. Mine was less than 10. Don't remember what it was. It could have been five, could have been four, could have been eight. I don't remember. I just know it was thousands of dollars. I'm like, oh my gosh. How am I going to pay for this? I, I don't want to take on debt. I thought, well, I'll sell my Google, sell my Apple. What blew my mind is I hadn't been tracking it and I opened it up. And so I had been investing from this time, 2010, this is now 2014, for four years. And when I went to sell my stock, I sold to pay for the ring. Let's just say it was 6,000. I'm just going to pick a number. Let's just say it was $6,000. I sell 6,000 and I still had a higher balance after I sold from the ring than whenever I ever put in. Just completely blew my wife, blew me away. I learned this in college and deep down, I was like, I don't know if this is true. So if you're listening to me going, I don't know if this is true, just run the numbers yourself, start looking. That was my real experience of like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I just sold $6,000 of stock. I bought this ring and I still have more money in my account than I ever even put in. It just blew me away. Crazy. Let's keep going. Let's do some more. So I didn't just buy Google when I started and I wouldn't suggest you only buy one company either. So my second, actually, I think at the time, my favorite was first Apple. But uh, here, Ms. Her Hernandez owns a stock in Apple. And again, there's the four letters. You can Google that. And check this out yourself. She owns 220 shares, each valued at $171.21 on September 29, 2023, for a total value of 37000 whatever. If Apple has grown at this rate, Compounded continuously since her initial investment of this amount. How long has she owned the stock? Okay, what in the world's going on? Which formula would I choose this time? A acre. Why? What do you see? So a per. What they gave me a whole bunch of values. I wanted you to learn how to dis distinguish this because if you're going to research this on your own, you got to be able to figure out what they're talking about. What are the important numbers here? Interesting. Okay, that one. What is that going to be? Right. 
R. What are we actually going to say R is, though, for the calculator? 0.224. And that is truthfully what Apple has grown at. Okay, what else do we have in this problem? 131.29. Okay, now that, wait. Sorry, I lost the number. This one we're not actually going to use in this one, nor the 220. But we are going to use these two. What's this right there? That's A. How do we know? That's the value on September 29th. What else are we going to use? Uh, this is take away the dollar sign and the commas, 37666.20. And then the here. This, what value is this? Pete, now these numbers I'm getting very realistic because you have to buy in terms of shares. And that's why they're so crazy. If you ever are working a stock problem and you don't have crazy numbers, it's because they're not the real numbers anymore. They always, once they become these shares, they get crazy decimals. So they're always gonna look like that. What's the only value we're missing here? All right, take a guess. How much time do you think it would take in Apple if you bought Apple for 5,000 to become 37,000? Take your guesses. So, uh, how, many, how many years do you think? 12 years? All right, let's find out. 37, 666 dot, was it dot two? Equals? Five zero, you know, give me the other numbers. Five zero, six two point sixteen. I'm sorry, sixteen point six five e to the rate of point two two four, and we don't know how much time, do we? Comma t. Press enter. What do you get? Nine years. What I did is I looked back and I said, okay, what if you invested nine years ago? Which means every one of y'all would have been in, in school. Like we're not talking before you were born. You were like literally going to school. If you invested nine years ago, just then, think about your second grade teacher. If you had had, or if your parents had put in 5,000 then, today it'd be worth $37,600. Isn't that crazy how it adds up? It says, if the stock continues at this rate, Ms. Hernandez does not make any further transactions, what will be the value of her shares after another 10 years? Let's go back. So what's her value now? Her value now is 37666.20. And we want to do this E to the power of point. What was the rate for Apple? 224? And we want to do it for 10 more years. Press enter. She does not touch that. Now, this means that we're investing this for a total of 19 years. Nine here, 10 more here in Apple, and Apple grows at the same rate it has in the last nine years. What is that $37,000 worth? Okay, I want to make sure... Might not finish the packet. I'm sorry for that, but I want to make sure you totally understand what I just showed you here. Y'all are how old? About 17 years old? Yes. What you could do here, if Apple grows at the same rate, what this means is if you could earn $5,000 over, let's just say, the next three years, to where you're now 20, and you took that $5,000 and you bought Apple and it grew at the same rate from the time you're 20 for 19 years. How old is that? How old are you now? Uh, 39. You're now 39. Your $5,000 that you earned while here, you're 17, 18, 19. That $5,000 you worked so hard for. How, how much money did you work for? $1,000. That means you're flipping burgers at McDonald's. You're making those Subway sandwiches. You're frying those Cane's chicken tenders. And you worked hard for 5000 But instead of just blowing it by the next iPhone and the new Beats and whatever else we blow our money on, you just say it at 20 years old, you decide, I'm going to take that 5000 by Apple, and you don't touch it. 
when you're 39, how much money has your $5,000 turned into? $353,000. Now, that's the facts of how Apple has grown. Does that mean it's going to continue to grow the same? No. So you you might not all get that, but this is where a lot of people, you can read up, I can talk to you more about this. Some people will say, okay, I'll buy some Apple, I'll buy some Home Depot, I'll buy some Starbucks. Because they think, well, if Apple doesn't do as well, maybe Starbucks will. And they diversify. Now, you probably won't hit the home run that way as much, like here, but that's how it works. All right, now let's talk about credit cards. Example 3D. Mr. Johnson opens a credit card with a 21.9% interest rate and a credit limit of $4,000. He is told that if he pays his balance with it in full within one year, he will not have to make any interest payment for this promotion. Mr. Johnson maxes out his credit card. That means he spends all $4,000 in the first month and chooses only to make the minimum payment of $25 per month throughout his first year, what will be the balance of his account after one year? Assume interest is compounded monthly. Okay, so now we're talking about credit cards. So yeah, your credit card, your interest is supposed to uh, compound monthly. So if it compounds monthly, the formula we're using now is not A per, and the formula we're gonna use now is A equals P times one plus your rate over N to the power of NT. Now this is how credit cards get you is they tell you, hey, you can, uh, if you open a credit card with us, we'll allow you to spend $4,000. And you won't have to, part of this promotion is pay back within a year. So many people spend that 4,000 and they get their bill in and it says nothing's due and so they don't pay it. And they don't pay the next month. They don't pay the next month. And the whole goal for the credit card company is they want you to look up and after a year have not made your payments. And so this interest rate kicks in. And then all of a sudden, this rate of 21.9%, which is 0 0.219, will kick in and all at once, they'll calculate all the interest that has should have been accruing, but because of the promotion, hasn't shown up on your account. So in this case, if it's monthly we're talking about, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, let's switch this over here. Monthly is gonna be N equals 12, but it's 12 months per year. So we're gonna have 12 there and also a 12 here. And we have this rate of, write this over here, the rate of 0 0.219. What we wanna know is what's gonna be our balance after we go one year. So the one thing that's gonna change here, uh, T is gonna be one for one year. Uh, let's see, what will be after one year? There's our T. Now, what's going to happen is my four thousand. We're actually going to pay twenty five payments, twenty five dollar payments, and we're going to do this twelve times. So that P is actually going to be a little bit less. So we'll type that in and see. Let's go to our calculator and find out what happens when they first actually calculate our credit card. So we spent four thousand, but we did make the minimum payment that they required us, which was twenty five dollars per month, and we did that each month. So for twelve months. Now, all at once, they're going to accrue the interest. Let's say we made this credit card on January 1st, and we don't pay it off by December 31st. So the next January 1st, all of a sudden, here comes the interest. So it's one plus that rate of 0.219, I think. I'm blanking here. Let me check it. 0.219, yep. And even though it had not been a part of the uh, promotion, they don't accrue interest during the first 12 months. What they do do is at the end of the promotion, if you haven't paid it off, they will back uh, they will back charge you. If you don't think so, read the fine print the next time you get a credit card in the, uh, invitation in the mail, read the fine print. You'll see that's what it'll say. And so there are 12 months here times one year. And so let's see. How much do you actually all of a sudden owe? You owe, now get this, you've already paid 25 times 12, which is, uh, you've already paid $300 in. And now you owe, not 4,000, but you owe approximately 4,600, plus you've already paid that. You owe, I mean, this is they're, getting, they're gonna take $900 from you. Why? You only got $4,000 worth of product. You owe them 4,600 and you've already paid them 300, you're, they're gonna get an extra 900 off of you. This is how credit card companies make so much money. Which by the way, you can buy credit card stock if you're interested. 
look up like MasterCard or Visa or something like that. So how much money, uh, what will be the balance of the account? This amount right here is going to be the balance of the account. $4,596.79. Uh, what will be your balance? Four thousand five hundred. Was it? Uh, whoops. Ninety six dollars and seventy nine cents. Four thousand five hundred ninety six dollars and seventy nine cents. And keep in mind, we've already paid. $300. So that's not saying take 300 off that. No, that's on top of the 300 you've already paid. So you owe them $4,896.79 in total. Now, here's something we really got to use a calculator for. If Mr. Johnson increases his monthly payment to $100 per month, starting in year two, so meaning after the first calendar year, what will the balance be after those full two years? And so let's just play around the calculator here for a second. Here's how this is going to work. You take the new balance, which is there, $4,596.79. And what we're going to do is each month, we're going to pay $100. Okay. So we're going to subtract 100. Now, whatever balance is left over, we'll go through and get interest added to it. And so the interest rate is 0 0.219 divided by 12, so that'll get the monthly interest rate, and then we'll raise it to the power of uh, however many months have gone by. So in this case, we're talking about not a full year, we're gonna say, what happens after one month? So after one month, we pay $100, and what's our new balance? Shouldn't the balance go down $100? No, because all the rest of the balance earns interest, and even though you paid $100 to them, how much do you now owe? Check this out. After one month, so we've gone from January to February, your balance has only dropped approximately $18. And so we're going to do this again. Now, to make this faster, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy. So that right there is, uh, that was what your balance is on February 1st. Now I'm going to do this again, but I'm going to change this amount to the previous answer. And there's a way of doing this in the calculator. Ah, sorry is you're gonna hit uh, control ants right there. Now this, I wanna copy because we're just gonna do this a few times through just to see what it ends up. So I can do this faster and hit control C and I'm gonna press enter. What this is gonna do is gonna take this new balance. We're gonna make a hundred dollar payment to it, but then the rest is gonna get interest. This will take us to March. Okay, now there's March. I wanna hit control V and it's gonna post it again. It's gonna take this answer. So notice this time our balance went down another $18. I'm going to hit enter. This is now April. That's May. There's June. There's August. September. Oh, I forgot. July. So October. November. There's December's. We've rolled around and we'll, after paying them $1,200, we'll still owe this amount. Now, you might not have, I hit enter there quite a few times. You might be going, what in the world did he just do? What I did is I just submitted how much we paid all those different times and found out that after paying the credit card company $100 a month, 12 times. So I think I did that 12 times there. But what I got here is we paid the, calc I'm going to just mark, make sure you mark this. We've paid the credit card company. We've paid hundred dollars, whoops, hundred dollars, 12 times, which means we've paid in $1,200. And so what's our balance? We spent 4,000 originally, our balance remaining, remaining balance. $4,380.50. Now, how much does that irritate you to know? You spent $4,000 because you didn't get this credit card paid off in time. All of a sudden, it started accruing interest. And now you paid in $300 here, another $1,200. You paid in $1,500, and your balance has only increased 
$380 more than what you ever bought product. And you have paid them when you add that up, a total of uh, $1,500. That would be year two or in the second year. This is the first year you paid in. You paid in a total of 1500 between your two years and you still owe more than you began with. That's how, how people in the United States of America get in such debt. Credit cards will eat your lunch. All right. Now I showed you how to invest here uh, in these. Say, uh, these are pretty safe accounts, riskier when you use companies, but they can give you a higher reward. I showed you here how you can become in debt by using credit cards. And now let me go to the last one. How about buying a house? If you want to buy a house valued at 350000 which is just above the median Texan Texas household price. I think when we Googled that earlier, or wait, was it three fifty one? dollars Well, it's something like that. That's about the, the price of a home in Texas right there. The mortgage rate is 8.269 as in October 1st, 2023 for a 30-year fixed loan. So the Gonzalez put 20,000, 20% down at closing, what will their monthly payment be? So let, let's think about this. If you took 350,000 and you had 20% of it to pay initially. So you saw the house costs $350,000. So I'm gonna take $350,000 and we had 20% to pay. So that's 0.2. We pay $70,000 at closing. That means that's what how much money we've saved up. We have saved up our down payment here, the down payment. Actually, I'm going to leave that for post my values later. Let's write it over here. Down payment is equal to $70,000, which means the mortgage itself is not three hundred and fifty. dollars That's the house price. The mortgage would be $350,000. Uh, dollar sign, 350000 minus the 70000 which means I'm taking out a loan for $280,000. Now, that's how much I borrow from the bank. The rate here is 0. Point, move the decimal two times over, 0. 0.8269. And the time is 30 years. We want to know what's the monthly payment. Well, to find that out, we first have to figure out how much do we have to pay the bank. Okay, so what's our monthly payment? So what we're going to do is use this huge formula where it says use MP. That's the monthly payment will equal the principal, which uh, that's going to be our mortgage. That's going to be our P here. And we have all that. And for a, uh, you make monthly payments. So N is 12. So let's go type these in. We're going to take this formula and plug these in to find out how, what will our monthly payment be? So the monthly payment formula was you do control divide, you get a fraction. It's the principal, 280,000 times, and this was the rate. 0.08269 over 12. Let me make sure I got that right. Principal times rate over N divided by parentheses. It's going to be one minus another parenthesis over parenthesis. I don't want to. Parenthes, no, not a bracket, sorry. Parenthesis one minus another parenthesis one plus. Let me make sure I have that right. Uh, one minus parenthesis one plus rate over n. 0.086 or two six nine over twelve, and all this second uh, this inside parenthesis is raised to the power of negative n, which is twelve times t, which is thirty. I'll just make sure I got that right. The inside. Parenthesis is raised to the power of negative nt, negative 12 times 30. All right, so when I press enter, this will show me my monthly payment. My monthly payment is $2,107.29 when I round. So on the remaining balance, I'm paying that amount there. Let's add that over. And so now we've calculated the monthly payment. What am I paying to get that dream house of mine? My monthly payment 
MP would equal $2,107.29. Now, y'all don't even know about escrow and things like that. You got to be paying saving for taxes that you'll have to pay the Texas state government. You're going to have to have home insurance. So you're that's going to, this number is only going to skyrocket. Let me just say it that way. It stinks. And you're going to have repairs and stuff like that. It's crazy. This is what happens when the rates are this high. But there's our monthly payment. So here's the question. What is the final cost of the home? Not to including taxes, not including home insurance, just the final cost of the home that the, the Gonzales have after 30 years make to the bank for this mortgage. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our mortgage value and we're going to say we're going to pay that amount. The amount we pay, which was $2,107.29. We make that payment 12 times a year. And then we do that for 30 years. How much do we actually pay the bank? We pay the bank this amount of money. Isn't that crazy? Plus, you had to put $70,000 down when you first bought the house. So how much did that $350,000 house actually cost you? It costs you almost a uh, million dollars. It's eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, eight hundred twenty-nine thousand. If you round uh, by the time you've ever paid that off. Now tell me, these loans stuff can add up. You can get into all kinds of debt in a hurry. Now housing loans are way better than credit cards because at the end of the day, a house you can turn around and usually sell for a little bit more than you paid for it. But I, I just think that it's completely cra a crazy here. The final cost. So uh, the bank gets, so here we go. The down payment, the down payment was 70,000. The loan with interest turned out to be 75,000. No, 758,000, sorry, 758,624 dollars and 40 cents. And when we add this up, we get the total cost of the home. Though it said it was going to be $350,000, we actually paid $828,624.40. Uh, $828, That's the actual cost of the home. Wow. Money can really add up to help you or work against you with exponential. These are very important formulas to learn.